So good afternoon. Welcome back from lunch. Uh, this session will be looking at climate change. We heard a lot from Senator Whitehouse and from John Podesta this morning about uh, climate change affecting the world, uh, no less than that, but in particular our oceans. Uh, but before we start with the wonderful panel, and I introduce Holly Bamford as the moderator of that panel, it's, uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Congressman Jared Huffman, uh, who represents the second district of California, a relatively new district, uh, and then encompasses uh, in Northern California, uh, all the way from the coast of Oregon down to San Francisco. It's a huge swath of coastline that includes uh, not one, but two national marine sanctuaries. Uh, Congressman Huffman serves on the Bicameral Task Force on Climate Change, the House Oceans Caucus, the National Marine Sanctuary Caucus, and the Sustainable Energy and Environment Coalition. He's worked tirelessly for the environment of California and of the nation. And so we're very delighted to have the Congressman here with us. Uh, I apologize for starting a little late. There were votes on the Hill. and. Um, uh, but we're very delighted that the Congressman was able to make it over to uh, start this session for Chow. Congressman. Thank you. Well, thank you. It is great to be with all of you today, with all of the scientists and advocates and experts who are doing such great work for our oceans uh, each and every day. And I want to thank you for having me and uh, giving me the honor of introducing this next panel, the, uh, the topic of the next panel is a bit of a rhetorical question. It's, uh, are we ready for the worst? Uh, one of those great climate questions that we ask. If you don't mind, I'll just cut to the answer. Are you kidding me is the answer. We're not even close to ready for the worst. We're not even close to doing what we do, what we need to do uh, to match the threat that is posed to us by global climate change. But it is complicated. And so you know we do have to step back and have these sober academic discussions about it, even though we all know it's obvious we're not even coming close to doing enough about this. And there are a few things that I think uh, explain the sheer complexity of this challenge in this interconnected world better than the California drought that my district and many in California are experiencing this year. This is a glaring example of the impacts of climate change, and it's going to create major problems that I think highlight the interconnectedness of uh, of the challenge. Last year, as some of you know, California had its driest year ever on record. We uh, only had a quarter of our average snowpack. We saw our rivers and streams impacted dramatically. It's going to affect uh, water temperatures, uh, the amount of habitat available. It's, it's very, very severe. Things are so bad that the state of California took the unprecedented step of trucking 30 million young Chinook salmon around river habitat that they would ordinarily be released into uh, to help improve their chances of survival in the ocean, uh, avoiding these hostile drought conditions in rivers. Another unprecedented step was taken uh, a, a month or two ago, and that is that at the time when salmon are most in need of flows to out-migrate and continue in their life cycle, some shortcuts were taken in the delta, and pumping was allowed in, in contravention of the biological opinions that protect winter run salmon. And so the, the combination of these factors, I think, is something we, we need to expect to have pretty dire consequences on this year class of salmon. And when you begin to talk about losing an entire cohort, an entire year class, that's a big, big deal. Um, we know that we're seeing record levels of strandings and die-offs for uh, certain types of marine mammals, sea lions and seals, up and down the coast of California. And we can expect that to get worse. We know that if we see this dramatic impact to our salmon populations, that is going to further impact those marine mammals. There's a resident pod of orca whales. I think it's a resident pod. There's transient and resident, right? Some of you would know this. Orca whales. We got orca whales off the coast of California, and they like to eat salmon. And when we have a lot less salmon, that's going to have impacts on the orca whales. So we're seeing the chain of events already that we know are going to be coming with the crash of a fishery that unfortunately is, is kind of baked into this drought and to the impacts that we're, that we're dealing with. And humans are going to be affected too because my district is home to a lot of the folks who for 
generations have engaged in commercial salmon fishing. We've got entire communities that are going to feel that. This is a $1.5 billion commercial, tribal, and recreational fishing industry in California. And, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that the fishermen in my district and in other parts of California are going to have the kind of political support and the kind of PR machine that we see for the big, powerful corporate ag interests in the Central Valley of California who seem to be uh, very well represented right now in this crisis. So this domino effect uh, is something I'm thinking a lot about and our response to even it doesn't really scratch the surface of being prepared for the worst of climate change. Those of you that are experts and care about our oceans, and that's all of you because you wouldn't be here, know that ocean acidification is another one of these just massive, massive impacts that we have to start thinking about and grappling with. We've got to start taking a holistic approach, I think, to protect our oceans and to get ahead of this crisis. That includes passing drought relief bills that take into account the health of our waterways and our oceans. President Obama's efforts, obviously, to fight climate change with his new carbon pollution rule is a very, very important step, and I hope that he will continue to use his executive authority to push the envelope of stepping up to this challenge. And I'm glad that we're seeing some bipartisan progress to fight climate change uh, in the form of the Ocean Acidification Innovation Act. That's a good bipartisan step in the right direction. But again, to answer the rhetorical question posed for this panel, I got to say, we're not even close to doing enough. Uh, and if anybody feels differently, I, I wish I could hang around to hear it. But unfortunately, I have to hustle back and cast some votes on the floor. Uh, I think Congress and, and really all of us have our work cut out for us, and I'm glad to see you all here. I'm glad to see you posing these questions and inviting a terrific panel to uh, kick us off with our discussion. Thanks very much. So thank you, Congressman. It's uh, now a great uh, honor to uh, introduce Dr. Holly Manfred. Uh, Holly is a close colleague uh, who uh, started many years ago as the uh, first director of the Office of uh, Marine Debris or the Marine Debris Program. She moved up to be deputy administrator, uh, deputy um, assistant administrator for the National Ocean Service (NOS), and then now she's the head of the National Ocean Service. And uh, under Holly's leadership, NOS is looking at the cutting edge and most important issues of our day, uh, particularly in terms of um, resilience, uh, coastal infrastructure, preparedness, uh, data, as we talked about this morning, and response. And really, there's an awful lot of uh, responsibility under Holly's tenure right now, and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing some of it during this session. Holly will introduce the rest of the panel, and I'll leave it to you. Thank you. Thank you, Jason, very much. Well, thank you. And one thing you, you forgot, a big priority is place-based conservation, sanctuary's nomination process. It's out. <laughs> <laughs> so um, welcome, everybody. Uh, very happy to be here. We have a phenomenal panel in front of us. We have a mixture of academic, private sector, uh, both state, federal government, academia. And um, as the congressman said, said, we are not ready. And I think what we're going to do today is have a very frank and open conversation with our panel members about you know, what, what are the big challenges and what can we do. And hopefully leave here with some actions. Because everybody in this room, you know, we're really preaching to the choir. But I think the key of leaving here is leaving here with some actions and ideas that we can take from this panel of experts and think about how we can move the ball forward in face of some of these challenges. So first thing I like to do is, is welcome and introduce all our panel members. And then given I have a scientific background, I like to give a couple of facts about the climate realities. And then I'm going to pose a question to our panel members uh, to start addressing. So let me go ahead and welcome our panel members. Uh, right here to my left is Se Senator Kevin Ranker. And he joins us from Washington State Senate, where he has used his diverse background to advance community development strategies and conservation initiatives both in the US and internationally. In the Washington State Senate, Kevin has advanced key legislation focused on climate, energy, coastal and marine management, transportation, and ag. And gay marriage. <laughs> and gay marriage. Two, 
Mr. Frank Nutter is the president of the Reinsurance Association of America. He has been for over 20 years. Frank has been and remains involved with other key national and international insurance organizations, and he also serves as the advisory board of the Center for Health and Global Environment. Among many other diverse science and safety related groups, Mr. Nutter was an officer in the U.S. Navy and Vietnam War. Next to Mr. Nutter is Mr. Roy Wright. He is Deputy Associate Administrator for Mitigation at FEMA. He is responsible for the risk analysis and risk reduction programs under FEMA's Stafford Act and the National Flood Insurance Program. Collectively, the program Roy is responsible for promoting is a risk conscious culture and address long term vulnerabilities in communities across the United States. Next to Mr. Wright is Dr. Michael Castanelli. He is Dean of the School of Fisheries and Ocean Science at the University of Alaska in Fairbanks. He brings a wealth of academic experience where he is widely published on marine mammal biology, physiology, and a passion for education. Michael has worked with students, teachers, and the public on climate change issues in the north and across the country. He has regularly speaks on the Arctic, the Antarctic, and their oceans. And last but not least, Rear Admiral Jonathan White is the oceanographer and navigator of the U.S. Navy, a post he has held since 2012. The Admiral is also the Navy's Director of Task Force Climate Change and is academically trained in oceanography and meteorology. I like that oceanography is first. <laughs> <laughs> the Admiral previously served as Commander, Naval Meteorology and Oceanography Command before assuming his current duties. So let's welcome the panel members. <clears throat> So before we get in the first question, I just want to pose some of these climate realities. And I know we've heard, and I don't want to go too long, but we've heard a lot of them this morning uh, from the other panel members, as well as the congressman just recently. So just, just a couple facts to throw out there for people to be aware of. In terms of severe droughts, as Congressman Huffman mentioned, California had its worst drought in history last year. And this is true for several states in 2012, uh, which was on record. Drought monitoring reports that in 2012, the United States experienced the driest conditions in more than a decade. Billion dollar disasters like Sandy. We are seeing an increase in the number of disasters per year. We used to average two disasters that cost over a billion dollars in the 1980s. Now we're aver averaging close to six. And in 2012, we saw 14 storms or climate events that cost this country over a billion dollars. We just can't afford these types of events. A future of changing sea level rise and coastal flooding. In the Hampton Roads area of Virginia, with at the end of the century, they're going to have 5.5 feet of sea level rise within the Hampton Roads area. Storm surge and storm flooding. It only takes a half a foot of water to knock over an adult in a severe flood event and two feet of water to move a car. Coastal development of population. Since the 1970s, the U.S. coastal population has increased by 40%. And by 2020, we're going to see an 8% increase in post coastal population. So while we know these issues are out there along the coast, people will continue to move towards the coast because they want to live there. The question is, how do we live there collectively with the ocean? Food security. There was recently a study published in Nature found that as sea life moves from warmer tropics to the colder poles, no new species are moving into the warmer areas to, to replace the migrants. So we're definitely seeing a change. And a lot of this change is being seen by the fishermen. They're seeing, they're the kind of our coal mine, the canary in the coal mine on the water. So given these climate realities, I would like to pose the first question to the panel. And I'll start here with you, Kevin. So based from your perspective, and it's really from everybody's, your e uh, each perspective on the things you do daily and, and the work that you conduct, um, what do you see as the greatest challenge in combating climate impacts, mitigation, and adaptation from your perspective? Politics. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. We can, we can argue uh, all we want till we're blue in the face about where we need more science or better science, but uh, the facts are clear. Climate change is real. If you don't agree with me, you're wrong. Um, <laughs> and uh, and uh, I'm sorry, I don't have an inner voice. Um, uh, and, and the problem that we have is, is politics. The problem that we have is decision makers being willing to make the difficult decisions. 
there is no other problem with, with climate change. The, uh, we, we have ways to deal with climate change. We don't have the political will to deal with climate change. Senator. Uh, Holly, if I could uh, go back to 1960 and you know, I formulated my answer for your question, which to a lot of people in this audience may seem like really ancient history. I realize that. Uh, as a uh, ninth grader, I, I was asked to participate in a debate before the PTA. There were probably 500 people in the room. I'm a ninth grade, 14-year-old. And I'm asked to take the position that we should deal in our community with uh, environmental issues. Uh, and I grew up in a community that had seven major chemical plants along the river, uh, and it's a coal-based state. Uh, and uh, the, my opponent in the debate took the position, uh, was assigned the position of, uh, well, it's about the economy, that we should be mindful of the economy. So at, at the end of this debate, uh, well, as I thought I did pretty well, they took a vote to show of hands. Uh, and I was crushed uh, in this debate. And it's the first lesson I learned about that, and that is that jobs trump the environment. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's something that still applies. The public, in my view, doesn't understand the consequences of climate change. They do not embrace, they have not been affected by the consequences. And as a result, the political process, to the senator's point, is doesn't feel the pressure of doing anything about it. So my, my comment would be, un unless we change the dialogue to say that dealing with climate change can also improve the quality of life, uh, can improve the economy, uh, can improve uh, people's health, or at least uh, start to, to reverse the risk of health, and the public embraces that, that we're a long way from getting the political system to act to deal with uh, the causes as well as the consequences of climate change. Roy? Right. So I'll be careful. As I say, the greatest challenge. How about a great, uh, one okay. of the great challenges? Uh, and within my purview, we, I'll focus particularly on the adaptation side of the equation. And we look at this issue of, so where, are, where is the built environment situated and what are we doing about it, where it sits today and where it will be tomorrow? As much as I wish we would do more about the current built environment, most of our actions, frankly, are pretty incremental and insufficient. And while I don't want to accept that reality, um, I'm forced then to says the piece that I probably can do much more about is the future built environment. And so I spend a great deal of my time focused on that, whether that's new construction or we're dealing with that from a rebuilding uh, or recovery element as people emerge from a disaster. So what do they need that we don't have enough of yet? They need data that is specific to that geography. We've come a long way at the National Climate Assessment. We can begin to see where things are headed from a geography perspective. But if we want to see communities take action, they need to understand their data. And first and foremost, we need to ensure that citizens have a sense of urgency about it. Because as I look at this as communities I travel across, when citizens um, are prepared to act, that they have that sense of urgency, the political class tends to respond. Something about the voting cycle. Um, <laughs> Shocking. Shocking. By which you get engaged local leaders. And the best engaged local leaders that I've interacted with across the country then find a way to make it matter to that community. And so to your point, sometimes we're more driven by the economics or the natural and cultural functions or the schools or the infrastructure or health concerns. I've become a pragmatist in that whole conversation. Each community kind of reflects the people who live there. Which of those drivers matter most in that community? And I will ride that horse all the way to an outcome for a far more resilient community. So I'll leave it this. I think our greatest challenge is to have the right kind of information and data, but to ensure as us as leaders in this community of practice uh, don't get too far wedded to one particular view, but ensure that we're continuing to adapt and reflect those needs so that we can achieve the outcome, which is more resilient communities. Okay. Michael. Uh, two, part, two part answer to that. One is I spoke to a group like this in Australia. And uh, their questions were not the same as the ones here, because we have uh, geopolitical issues that we're involved with worldwide. So even if we were to achieve the goals that we had today, which are very important, we talked about in the first session of getting some votes done another mile down the road there. Uh, we still need to talk about 
Australia and the Arctic and the Antarctic and Japan and China and a variety of other areas. And geopolitics is a big issue. But if you think about what we did for the ozone hole, that can happen. And it starts at a local level and then moves on out. And once you get past the economics of it and some of the politics, then you start to get geopolitical action. The other ways of looking at that, and again, talking to groups of, of people, is the difference between a value decision that we have to make. We talked a little bit about values this morning versus something you really don't get to vote on. So you can vote on, as a citizen and as your representatives on whether or not you want to value a particular ecosystem over another, or whether you want to cap and trade CO2. You can do all these votes. You don't get to vote on whether or not more CO2 in the ocean makes it acidic. Apparently, a lot of people get to believe, hey, if we just argue against this, then that's not the case. You don't get to vote on the value of pi. You don't get to vote on whether or not whales migrate. You don't get to vote on whether or not you take too many fish out of the ocean. There are less fish in the ocean. Those things you don't get to vote on. You get to vote on the values associated with them. And that's, uh, we're talking about value decisions here. Where do you want the values uh, to lie? Right. Admiral. Thank you very much. Uh, I agree with all of you. Uh, I'm going to. Read you a quote. There is widespread agreement that our oceans and marine re resources are in serious trouble. Our nation lacks effective mechanisms for incorporating scientific information into decision making in a timely manner. That was a quote from <coughs> Admiral Retired James D. Watkins in 2004 in the publishing of a blueprint for the 21st century ocean, a result of the Ocean Commission, which was started around the turn of the century. A decade ago, he said that. I believe the greatest challenge is making decisions and decisions to act. And something that I pride myself in decision making is because that's what we do as oceanographers in uniform is turn scientific information into decisions, tactical operational decisions. Last Wednesday afternoon, I was playing ultimate frisbee or frisbee football with a bunch of young sailors. I made a tactical decision. I was going to go for that Frisbee that was hanging about yay high. <laughs> so I jumped off the ground, and I came down, and my knee didn't like the way that I came down. It decided it was going to bend in a manner which had never bent before. Thus, my leg is on the side of this table. A bad decision, but a decision nonetheless. Not advised in decision making. But going back to climate change and decision making, it's great to have an audience here because when you look at the decisions that we have to make, it incorporates scientific information and in turning that into decisions. It incorporates psychology. How do you get at the psychology of behavior? It, in, it incorporates, unfortunately, politics has been, has been talked about. A lot of different things have to come together to make the right decisions now, or at least some decisions now, that can lead to the mitigation and adaptation associated with climate change. We have to do a better job of characterizing uncertainty, communicating a compelling need to act, that's a decision, and instilling confidence in the decision makers. That's good. Great. Now just don't take your shoe off, because I think we're going to hear from Dan and Jason. Keep that shoe on. <laughs> aye, aye, ma'am. <laughs> so we heard a number of different challenges, which I think, you know, politics, jobs, economy's big, more data, more discrete, probably local data versus the global, value decision and decisions to act. So I guess I'd like to drill in a little more on this um, and maybe think about, OK, so with all those issues, and I think politics plays a big role in it because you know, I know mayors want to protect their cities, and, but, and they want to make sure everybody's safe, but they don't want you to leave. It's their tax base, right? So, so what, what are some of those incentives that we can provide people <coughs> to make change as they face climate? And uh, I'll give you an example. I was talking to the, uh, both the reinsurance industry but also the real estate industry. And I said to the real estate industry, listen, and it wasn't the whole industry, but you know, mind you, a couple folks. And I said, would you be interested in a climate uh, sea level rise visual tool that shows you the movement of sea level rise over a 30 year time frame? And they said, well, that sounds really great, but you know what? I don't need that because I care about five years. I care about the time it takes me to buy the land, to build a building, to sell the property, and the risk to somebody else. And they say, I'm not being mean, but this is my job, and if I don't do it, somebody else will. So I asked the reinsurance industry, and they said, we do care, because we need to look at those 30-year risk assessments. So I'd like to pose a question to either Frank or Roy, and you guys can decide, but what, you know, how do we, because change is going to come from policy and from politics, but it's really those in the front line of the economy and the industries that also can help make those incentives work. What from your 
uh, experience, can we get people to start thinking about climate because it's so far off? What are some of those incentives to get people to start doing things now versus infrastructure, where they build, how they rebuild, to kind of act on it now while those policies are not in place? I'll go first. You want me to start? Go ahead. Uh, the insurance, you mentioned a canary in a coal mine. I've often thought that premiums that people pay for whatever they insure, could be automobile, homes, whatever, are also that kind of canary. It's a risk uh, assessment message, if you will, to people. As long as the process, whether it's a public program like the National Flood Insurance Program uh, or private insurance is restricted in what message it sends by the cost of the decisions people make, including the mitigation measures that they take, uh, then we've muted that message. Uh, and as long as the disaster assistance system, very politicized disaster assistance system in this country, respond as if it were insurance and basically either try to make people whole or put money back into for people to rebuild, it's a mixed message. So I guess my short answer would be looking at it from that silo of insurance is that risk-based pricing in public programs or private programs is really the appropriate thing to do to send that risk signal. If there are people who are affected by that that are low income, fixed income, or have other needs, then target the subsidies, make them, make them uh, provide subsidies, but send that message about what the cost of that risk is. You know, whether or not you think positively about the insurance industry and our black hearts about what we, what we charge, the reality is uh, it, it's an interesting way to send people the signal about the consequences of the decisions they make about where they build and how they build uh, or whether they retrofit in those areas. Good. Roy. Right. I'll build on this with two, two prongs. One of them is the pricing signal is, is the incentive that consistently works. Uh, the National Flood Insurance Program has gone through a couple of reforms in the last year. I'll save my comments for that for another time. But it, during the middle of one of those reforms um, was the days that followed Sandy. Uh, at the coming of shore in New Jersey. And as people along the shore began to rebuild, they wanted the data about where things were headed, mm -hmm. and they wanted to understand the price points of what it was going to cost to see their homes and their families sustained in those areas for decades to come. And at that point, uh, we were moving in a direction where we were going to be fully actuarially sound without the statutory discounts in the National Flood Insurance Program. And people said, I will pay the money to build higher and stronger. I will assume an amount of this is going to take place. Because they could see that through the pricing signal. Now, in the absence of being able to use pricing signals, we then get to a point that says, how do we put the right elements in place so that communities are making good choices in that direction. I've got a couple instruments available to me. One of them is there are 22,000 communities in the National Flood Insurance Program. It's a voluntary program that covers 98% of the nation's population. And every one of those communities adopts a local land use ordinance dealing with flood risk. Today, that is retrospective. And part of what we're grappling with now is what does it mean to make that prospective? We've taken some initial steps in that direction. You actually will see discounts in your flood insurance premiums if you take those steps. But I think in the next um, season, we have some choices to make about whether or not we're going to lean into that and make that to the point of being required. Yeah. The other element then turns into, so where do federal dollars go? Uh, a couple of us sit here from a federal um, angle. And on the federal dollar side of the equation, um, we spend a tremendous amount of money in communities across this country building things and putting them in harm's way. And we know what the future risk is. And there really has to be a shift in our point uh, on the federal side that says, to the degree of federal dollars being invested, whether that's initial in some kind of hard construction or that's some kind of future element related to rebuilding, we need to ensure that we're building for the future. Some kinds of infrastructure, we may be looking out multiple decades from where I sit. We need to at least be looking at a 2050 horizon in terms of where that risk is headed and ensuring that if you're spending federal dollars, you're moving, you're, you will meet those higher standards. In both instances, you asked incentives. Yeah. And what I come back and respond with is, 
here are some ways either through market or regulatory elements we're going to compel certain kinds of action. <clears throat> Unfortunately, I think that's where we sit on much of this today. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hey, Holly, can I supplement my answer or the comment that was made? I, uh, Dennis Maletti is a professor or was a professor at the University of Colorado, and he wrote a book called uh, Disasters by Design, the thesis of which is probably obvious in this, and that is that as long as you encourage construction in these areas, you're, you're essentially designing these disasters in advance, really the point that Roy is making. <laughs> the other comment I want to make is about the insurance mechanism. I, I get asked all the time why the insurance industry doesn't do more to assimilate climate change scientific information into its process. And in the United States, the, the system largely is a, it's a business model with a retrospective look, that whatever you pay for automobile insurance or homeowners insurance or workers' compensation is largely based upon past losses trended forward primarily using economic factors. So the insurance industry says, well, if there is climate change, if there is climate change, it will show up in the loss data, uh, the claims, the Sandy claims, the Katrina claims, and that sort of thing. In my sector of the industry, the reinsurance sector, it, it's really kind of a different perspective, and that is, shouldn't we be more forward-looking? Shouldn't we, in fact, look out? There's a lot of scientific information that can be used now uh, to assess that risk, and we really ought to be using that. But the insurance mechanism, I, since I seem fairly positive about the value of incentives, it's got its own challenge about the way it perceives climate risk uh, in the pricing mechanism, which is really unfortunate. Roy, you, I think you mentioned something about infrastructure, and I want to uh, throw in a question because I'm getting questions from the audience. I think it ties in nicely to this, and I think I'll throw it to the Admiral, and if you want to punt, let me know. Uh, but Hard. You, <laughs> <laughs> like so uh, Navy has a lot of infrastructure along the shore, obviously, sure. and uh, it was built years ago, maybe not thinking about sea level rise, and Hampton Roads comes to mind to me. Um, question from the audience is, what are opportunities to use Coastal nature-based defenses or green infrastructure, or, you know, the natural or, or rebuilt natural infrastructure uh, to improve some of the resilience of your bases. Uh, Is that being considered in terms of yes, looking at some? Very okay. much so. And we are looking at Hampton Roads. We're looking at all of our DOD installations, putting them sort of in a three-tiered risk category, determine which ones are the most at risk due to sea level rise, largely. And then going through there, and the ones that are most at risk, we're doing much more in-depth in depth analysis, working with the Army Corps of Engineers, and then determining, OK, what would it take to make sure that Hampton Roads and our Navy Station in Norfolk, Oceana's places are going to be ready in 2100? What are the investments that need to be made? Start to make decisions now. And using the type of decision making, uh, adaptive decision making. So start to plan for whether it's a seawall, a levee, displacement of infrastructure, you can start to put all those things, what would it take, what would it cost, and then as we're a few years down the road with more time series of scientific knowledge of what's going to happen, we can figure out which place, sort of like an option playing football. Right. One of those things is certainly looking at, okay, the environmental factors, what, are the, what is the green technology, if you will, the way to restore some of the shoreline infrastructure, but if that's going to require a lot of it is either rebuilding seashore type of habitats and ecosystems or moving away. Right. and displacing populations. That's tough to do. And displacing whether it's infrastructure population is the kind of decision I don't think we're there yet. And a lot of it gets back to some reasons that we're, we're talked about here. So it's a factor, but it's one of many factors, and probably not, not at the top of our list anyway. Okay, mm -hmm. good. good. Michael, do you want? Yeah, um, I'm going to address the Admiral. I were talking about this just, uh, just before we started. Uh, Alaska has more coastline than all the rest of the United States put together. And the infrastructure is maybe a thousandth of the rest of the United States put together. And the coastal communities out there, some have been there for 5,000 years. So the, the questions of how we handle infrastructure is we, what we like to talk about, a new ocean showing up as the Arctic opens up, uh, is more than what do we do to repair what is there, prepare what's there. It's A, do we have any infrastructure at all? And B, how, what do you do with, with, a, with a community where they've been there for 5,000 years because that's where the ice, the ocean, and the animals meet, and the ice is changing, the ocean is changing, and the animals are changing. You've got, you've got, you've got some issues. Yeah. So another question from the audience, and, and uh, Kevin, I'm going to throw this at you from your perspective. 
Why does it seem so much more challenging to make progress on climate change than other issues like ozone and acid rain? So, you know, you said politics is an issue, and so how do you get people to talk, not, I mean, maybe we're, we're so, so there's, there's two issues. One is, uh, and, and you, you articulated this very well in your opening comments, the, the, we haven't made a clear connection between things that matter to people today mm -hmm. uh, and climate change, uh, and, and i.e. jobs. Uh, now, in the Northwest, with ocean acidification, for the first time ever, we were able to show a very clear linkage between climate and jobs. I lost uh, 311 jobs last year in Washington State because of ocean acidification. Uh, shellfish growers moved a, a out, an outfit to Hawaii uh, because of the 50-year-old upwelling that we were dealing with. Um, the second uh, factor there, however, is that somehow climate became partisan. Um, and, and that has been horrible. And, and, and it, it's interesting, I was on a, a, a trade mission with the UK uh, two or three years ago, right when the administration changed uh, for the United Kingdom. So they went from what would be a Democratic Party to what would be a Republican Party if you were in the United States. One of two things that didn't change in the entire administration's portfolio was their active approach to addressing climate change and, and increasing renewable energy in their portfolio. Uh, whereas in the United States, Al Gore was our greatest champion, and he was also um, a, a problem because it made it even more partisan. And so I think that we have not made the clear connection to jobs and impacting uh, uh, what matters to people. And I think that it's, it's become entirely too partisan. And I would say one last thing on this, which is, um, uh, and some of you have heard me say this before because I keep coming back to it, but if people remember Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, okay, and basically you can't satisfy one step until you've satisfied the step before that. And the top step is you're going to become self-actualized, which is like Yoda floating on a cloud. <laughs> so that's what we all want, right? Well, on the bottom of this pyramid, the first step you have to satisfy is food and water. And then there's shelter, and then there's companionship, and so on. Well, the people who come into my office, who I have to answer to, many of them are on the bottom of that pyramid. And they're coming in, they're worried about if they're going to feed their kids, they're worried about if they're going to keep a roof over their head, or they're going to make their rent, or keep their job. And uh, talking about climate, that's up to close to the top of the pyramid. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to reverse many of the arguments, and we need to get down to the basics, and we need to talk about how not doing something is going to cost you your job, how not doing something is going to cost you your livelihood. Yeah, that's good. And, th and I think that plays into, I mean, where climate it touches all of us is, you know, you talk about water security, national security, food security, and I want to pose this to Michael, uh, as well as you, Kevin, in terms of uh, ocean acidification. We are seeing drastic changes in the ocean. We have issues with food security. In your thoughts and in your research, are there ways we can better forecast the impact of this change and, ex and explain it at that, you know, fourth grade level so, you know, everybody's getting it and we can do some actions about it? The, uh, uh, I've, I've often said again in, 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 in large crowds that as a marine biologist, I, I, I am concerned about temperature changes, about um, impacts on coastal erosion, et cetera, but that ocean acidification worries me much more uh, in terms of, because now you are starting to, to alter the bases of the food chain. I also learned when you're talking in front of the public that about the moment you say ocean acidification, their memory goes back to sixth grade science, yeah. and they panic, and they think of pH, and they can't remember, does it go up, does it go down, you know, which, and, yeah. and, and, and trying to sell that in front of a crowd yeah. is really, really hard. And so I'm going to preview the last question that will probably be asked to us today on your action lines, things you can do. You want to get out on the firing line and try to discuss this issue, volunteer to teach at a middle school. <laughs> about climate change. I do that a lot. And, and you cannot be talking about really complex, pointy-headed academic agency level insurance issues and politics and who's voting. The kids want to know, what can I do? What can I go home and tell my parents about? Bam. And if yeah. you're talking about the ocean yeah. changing and it's going to mess around with your food, and in Alaska, where if you all had some go to Mrs. Renfrew's fish today and have some white fish, it's probably going to be Pollock. And it's probably coming from Alaska. And you know in our academic world or an agency world that's impacted by these changes, uh, then it starts to do this hitting home that you're talking about. So a lot of the communities in Alaska are asking questions like, I've got to go out and fish today. I've got to deal with the ice today or the lack of ice today. Uh, the ducks aren't where they're supposed to be. And, and that's very hard sell in Atlanta 
yeah. where Atlanta's going, I don't know, who cares about polar bears? They're cute, they drink Coke with penguins. I mean, what else, what else do <laughs> polar bears do? Uh, you've got to be able to translate that I'm, to a I'm school in Atlanta. And sliding on grass. Yeah, 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 and sliding on grass, that's right. You've got to be able to tell a, a school child in Atlanta why climate change is important. And, and, and this food, food security issue is one of them. I listened to an Alaska elder once speak to a bunch of school kids in, in New Orleans. And he said, I live outside all the time, 24 hours a day almost, out hunting, fishing, whatever. I can tell you the impacts of climate change on my food, on my security, and where I can hunt, where I can't hunt. In Atlanta or, or wherever you are, you're in an air-conditioned building most of the time. You can't tell that. If you lived outside all the time and had to pay attention to the grass and pay attention to the birds and pay attention to everything, you'd see the change too. And, the, and the, the change is there. It's a question of can you see it? And, and, and one of the most important places it will hit us, based upon what we're discussing here, will probably be in ocean protein levels and that being driven by uh, changes we're seeing there, whether it's temperature or ocean acidification. And, and when you talk about when it's going to impact people, like, like we were just saying, when they yeah. walk in saying, I can't fish, hunt, or gather my food anymore, or uh, my particular industry has a problem, uh, then we'll start, things will start to happen. Just stay on this line of security. I'll go with the Admiral and then to the Senator. Admiral? Yeah, I just want to add one point on the food security issue is that food security is a big concern that everyone needs to under understand. It, it impacts global security and national yeah. security. Tom Friedman wrote an excellent article that linked the droughts, the increased number of droughts, floods we have around the world. We've talked about the data is there. Droughts driving populations in Syria out of the farmlands into the cities that led to the civil unrest and the conflict that we have now. See the same thing going on right now in Somalia as there are issues with drought, food insecurity, driving populations to unrest. So we have to understand our national security is impacted by food security around the world. Um, there's uh, some new monitoring, you mentioned monitoring, there's some new monitoring that was just deployed in Washington State thanks to the folks down in Monterey Bay and our own uh, UW Ocean Acidification Center, which is doing incredible work with, with you guys as well. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, there's data that we've just discovered in the last year and a half with regard to OA that shows that local sources have a local impact. So we can literally start to look at watersheds and say nutrient loading in a watershed is increasing the severity and the frequency of ocean acidification events. So for me as a politician, that's a silver bullet because when I talk about monitoring or I talk, frankly, I talk about anything to do with oceans and most of my colleagues look at me like a dog, like a kind of <laughs> puzzled. But, uh, that it, you know, it's just not a big issue. We care about schools. I mean, so I, I've got to find $3.5 billion in January to just go to K through 12 education. And this is on top of making $9.7 billion in cuts to a $39 billion budget over the last five years. So. That's what matters, that's the priority. So when we talk about oceans, it's just not on the agenda. Um, and so getting it on the agenda is difficult when you talk about ocean acidification and the immediate pushback is, well, that's caused by you know, stuff coming over from China and what are we gonna do about it? And Washington State's only 0.06% of the uh, US carbon input output anyway, so who cares? Well, now I'm able to say nutrient loading in the Nooksack River is impacting not only shellfish, but thanks to your research, we now know that there's a food web connection with ocean acidification. So oysters are huge in Washington State. We produce 70% of the shellfish in the United States. Thank you very much. Uh, and, and it's really good stuff. Uh, you should all come to Washington, buy some, and then leave. Um, and then, uh, and leave. But, uh, uh, in, all, in all seriousness, we need to get beyond oysters. Uh, okay, this can't just be an oyster problem, but the food web connections are starting to show impacts at the base of the food web, which then impacts salmon tuna, other commercial, yes, but also recreational fisheries. And back to the jobs. I'm going to be a one-trick pony on jobs, all right? But back to the jobs. In Washington state alone, $1.6 billion in annual spending directly supporting 14,725 jobs last year directly associated with recreational fishing. If you want to impact a, a sea change politically, if you want, punt intended, if you want to uh, get communities to wake up, uh, yes, a crisis like Sandy, crisis creates community, mm -hmm. but there's also perceived crisis, which is you tell a fisherman they're not going to be able to go fishing, these guys are freak out. Yeah. Uh, and, and, they, and, and that's the sort of motivation we need. So the monitoring that is now in place 
is starting to be able to not only help our shellfish growers know when to harvest or when to close the gates to let the water in, but also giving us data that's showing these connections, which is absolutely critical. This is a great question, uh, lead into one of the questions that's come up. And, and uh, yesterday I was on a, a different panel and, uh, and talked about people, when, you, when we give out stats on climate and we're saying national this and national that, most people are like, yeah, that's great, but I really don't care. They actually care what's happening regionally, locally, and even in their creek. You know, they want to know, is my house going to flood, or is it, am I going to be able to fish in my backyard? Those are the questions that people care about. So leading into this question, we all need, we know, more and better data to make these types of decisions. The question is, is what should our focus be in gathering new data, or how do we modify our existing data to answer those local questions? So I'll, anybody who wants to start. Well, I, I, would, I would start this probably out of my field, but... One of the things that's been notable to me is the uh, reduced funding, let me put it in a positive way, that we need more funding for remote sensing capability, uh, for programs that do research uh, on climate and weather, so the National Science Foundation, NOAA's programs. Uh, the, I suspect FEMA has uh, similar kinds of programs. NASA, I know, has programs that if we're going to collect data and you want it more regionally focused, then we need to fund the kind of infrastructure around uh, data uh, to do that. The, the second thing I would offer is that um, the federal government does a remarkable job of monitoring weather and climate. Uh, we need to find a better way to transfer and translate that into the private sector, and I'm not suggesting mm -hmm. it's the government's fault or responsibility as much as we need to find a partnership that allows that kind of uh, open source for scientific uh, analysis in a transferable, translatable way. But I, I would start with this, uh, this recurring problem of underfunding of the kinds of systems that truly monitor and provide uh, insights about what's going on locally, not just big climate models, but the kind of regional monitoring. Yeah. We're going to take the question from, from two different directions. One side uh, is to understand that as we deal with these watersheds and what is flowing down, uh, these are folks in more of the riverine area, and we don't have nearly sufficient science from where we sit today. Uh, working with folks like Noah and the Army Corps of Engineers, there's ways to demonstrate and graphically depict, and let, they can see where 30 years worth of uh, climate uh, sea level rise yep. uh, could play out. We need to f and begin to close that gap both in the research and the modeling side. But I want to make sure that we don't delude ourselves because data alone is not the holy grail. So. I run a program where we roll out and we analyze risk. Up to this point, I'll be at retrospective, not prospectively. Uh, last year, 232,000 structures were taken out of the highest risk hazard area. 251,000 structures put in. Pretty close to the same number. We don't get thank you notes from the people who get taken <laughs> out. But the fastest way to galvanize a community is to tell them that their risk has expanded. Yeah. And they will tell you, you are wrong. <laughs> it cannot be true. Because if my risk has expanded, and now there are additional costs out of my pocket, I will fight you. Yeah. And so we're in a point by which, as we look at this, yes, we need more data. And I spend a lot of time, I'm a big advocate of data, and make sure we have the good elevation data and the models behind it. But let's not somehow think that if we brought perfect data into a community, it would do anything more than just galvanize the conversation, at which point mm -hmm. the points that the dean was making related to what difference does it make, and at which point Kevin says, they need to understand it in terms of jobs. And some of this information is going to say you're at greater risk. Some of it might even say it's time to retreat. Those aren't easy messages to hear, and they are very difficult messages to act on. Yeah, especially retreat. It's un-American. I heard yesterday <laughs> the word manage retreat. Manage that? retreat. Man yeah. I'm good. Managed by the managed, military? I don't know. Manage exit. <laughs> manage exit. So I have two quick things I want to add in on data. One is, as far as funding data, um, there's an incredible opportunity at the state level uh, in numerous states that I think is overlooked. Uh, we are continually looking to uh, Congress for money on some of this stuff. And uh, for instance, in Washington State, we stole uh, Senator Whitehouse's brilliant idea for the National Endowment for the Oceans, and we did it. 
So we created an ocean trust fund in Washington State, which takes a percentage of our bottom lands leasing revenue and permanently dedicates it to the non-sexy stuff. So marine spatial planning, which is about as not sexy as you get, um, and, uh, and ocean acidification and dealing with these things where you typically can't get the money. So two years ago, we put in 4.2 million, or 4.2 million came out of the leasing. Uh, this year was 3.7 million, um, and that's going to be ongoing. Uh, and so there's opportunities to fund things at the state level, leveraging uh, some of the great work from private entities, uh, some of the foundations and the feds, and then leveraging that. The second point on data, though, that I want to make is that, um, for instance, the, the numbers I just rattled off, $1.6 in spending, 14,000 plus jobs, um, uh, those aren't necessarily accurate in Washington state across the board. Those are, that's the best data you can get on recreational fishing, and it comes from a survey from U.S. Fish and Wildlife where they call a random amount of people in the, in the state and say, what are you doing? And then they extrapolate that across the state. The same holds true with my OA data. The same holds true, except for this late local watershed stuff that we're just starting to get. My point is, for politicians to really bite on something, to really care about it, we need to know that it's impacting our constituents. It is impossible for me to get data on the 40th legislative district in Washington State. It's impossible for me most of the time to even get county-based data. And so if we are going to make an argument for funding this critical work, for doing this critical work, we have got to start targeting our data around legislative districts, congressional districts, because until we do that, the decision makers aren't going to jump. And it's got to happen. And yes, it's more expensive. Yes, it's more complicated. So we can start with, you know, maybe you target decision makers who actually matter, who are key decision makers on appropriations at the state or federal level, or on the key committee chairmanships, whatever. But until we get that data where I can use it on the legislative level, so I can go to one of my colleagues and say, Jim, in your district, 75 jobs are going to be lost next week if we don't act on this. In your district, ecosystem services provide this many jobs. Those are the arguments that we need to make that we can't make legitimately right now. Yeah. It sounds like it's going to be a, a multifaceted approach to, to challenge this. Obviously, as Kevin, you're working hard at a state level to kind of show the data and push people that this is affecting jobs and food security. Um, but I also think about in my marine debris days is it's also going to take an industry to act. You know, I think about Whole Foods who decided to stop using plastic bags. They didn't have all the data in the world and they didn't have anybody you know, saying we're going to give you a benefit if you don't or if you do. What they did is basically said you come in, you buy a canvas bag, you get five cents off, you use a plastic bag, you pay five cents, and that's the way it's going to be. And the public complained and didn't want to buy their canvas bags, but now everybody has one. And you go to conferences, what do you get? You get bags. Uh, not plastic bags, but you get <laughs> bags. And most people use that to go to the grocery store. So sometimes you get you guys fighting for numbers and data to push the issue, but until the public comes in and complains about it, they have to actually see it work in action. So Frank, this is a kind of a question for you looking at, at, at the industry side, is how are mitigation measures showing up in ratings or in the strategic plans of S&P firms? Like you know, S&P 500 firms, like are people thinking about, you know, climate is going to be an issue. I could take a leadership role, even though I don't have all the information in front of me. I could start to drive the market or drive the community in a direction. Do, are you seeing that with some of the uh, association members? Uh, well, the reinsurers deal with insurance companies, so they're not consumer based. So I'm going to take them out of this, although they have influence. The 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 point in the insurance process that climate information is integrated with the actuarial approach that the industry uses are in what we refer to as catastrophe models. They effectively take scientific information as developed primarily by the federal government and data by the federal government uh, and overlay it on the on an insurance company's uh, database of homes, whatever they insure, wherever they insure it, whatever their style is. The, the, the process allows the company to look at climate risk, but frankly, it's a very <coughs> uneven process. And the problem in part is uh, that the regulatory system insurance is very, the prices are very heavily regulated. Whatever you think goes on, the reality is an insurance company can't charge you for your home or your car in most states unless it's approved by the insurance department. So the mitigation measures do get taken into consideration, but at a pretty remote level in the process. Mm -hmm. 
So an insurance company that wants to insure one of your homes in a certain risk area, it, it, it will ask information about elevation, uh, storm shutters, those kinds of things. So there's some credit associated with all that. But I would say that it's, it's too remote in the process on a, on a policy by policy basis to be terribly meaningful. That the, the, price, the, the price sensitivity associated with putting, doing a mitigation thing is pretty remote from what people pay. Yeah. Anybody else want to chime in on that one? Michael? I'm going to throw a, a, a risk uh, analysis out here for you. Most of the discussion we've had so far since we convened first this morning uh, to now has very accurately reflected exactly what we've been talking about, cost bases, jobs, impact to people, impact to infrastructure. Um, what do we do as a society about those places where there's uh, uh, lots of issues happening, but not a lot of people. So the entire Arctic Ocean, for example, there are only 4 million people on this entire planet that live above the Arctic Circle. So if you did this solely on a basis of economics and politics, we'd go, pfft, yep. who cares? And, uh, and yet, uh, we have a brand new ocean opening up, and we have military security issues, we've got fishing issues, we have all sorts of things, but not the people bases to have somebody knocking on somebody's door saying there's something happening out here on the coast that's a problem. And so the, 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 the risk analysis has got to be both the short term, here I am today, uh, my oyster farm is failing, which is a big issue, very important, can get lots of interests, and some section of, of the Arctic or the Antarctic that's changing that is probably going to have a huge impact on us but very hard to quantify in terms of, of the risk to, to, you know, to you sitting here right now today. Uh, you know, what's that risk? A very hard thing to try to translate. Yeah. Yeah. So we have 15 minutes left, or a little bit less. Um, I'd like to pose, and because I want to give plenty of time for this answer, because I think it's the most important uh, question to be asking. We've heard a lot about the challenges today. We heard a lot about things that maybe uh, we need in terms of data and information at a local level, better decision making. Um, given many of us in this audience here are with Inside the Beltway, dealing with policy and writing policy or working on policy, um, working on budgets and within the administration and the Hill, um, from the NGO community advocating and moving people forward, I'd like to pose a question to each of you uh, to answer, basically to answer, and that is, what is the one key action or recommendation that you can provide this community that we can do in terms of moving climate mitigation forward? So what can we do as a community that, that we could take action, either in the policy arena, budget arena, um, the NGO community, the federal community? Admiral, I'd like to start with you. What is one action or recommendation that we can take forward? So, well, other than the one of Mike to go out and volunteer at a middle school because that prepares you. It not just gives you great insight to the future of America, it really prepares you with dealing with all the political entities here in DC because they're about the middle school level. But uh. <laughs> I'm not right. But the real answer. <laughs> that doesn't mean you. <laughs> is that here in DC, not in Washington State. No, I said my, my comment I said under my breath is well I'm not running for Congress. <laughs> uh, we should be dissatisfied with the scientific predictions of weather and climate that we're getting for our investment as a nation. We invest more in research and prediction of weather, ocean, ice, climate than any other country in the world. Yet, we don't have the most accurate weather model in the world. They do at the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting. Different agencies have different programs, research programs, policies, sort of investments, but it's not been well cohered. So I believe one thing that we should do in Washington is to push for um, more of a cohesive approach to the prediction of what is going to happen with our oceans, our atmosphere, our climate, the Arctic ice. We're trying to do that with the Navy and NOAA and all the agencies toward a thing called the Earth System Prediction Capability, ESPC. I wanted to call it ESP National, but ESPN <laughs> was already taken. So ESPC, by trying to put together a governing organization to ensure 
the investments of those agencies is getting toward a single predictive system that will give regional, local, state, federal planners the best possible answer to then take that prediction down to the local level, to the geophysical level, to whatever it may be to make the right decision. So that's my one thought. Great. Push for that single predictive system. Thank you. Michael. I have a feeling that we'll be you know, progressing, so by the time here we'll, have, we'll pretty have much all the ideas set up. So I'm going to add to this one. I've already told you about teaching middle school. Uh, there's, there's, there's another concept to this, though, and, and that is that I was speaking to a crowd, again, in a group like this, and afterwards a woman scout leader uh, came up to me in tears and went, we didn't know it was this serious. What can we do? And if we can get to that one question with somebody asking you, your family, your kids, whoever, what can I do to help and get past the problem of, oh, I didn't know there was an issue. Uh, I, I, we, we were focusing too much on right now whether or not climate change is actually a concern or not. We should put that aside and say, yeah, we've got to deal with it. Somehow or another, each and every one of us in this room has got to be able to either reach to our constituents, reach to the people we're representing, NGOs, agencies, or whatever, and get an individual person to ask, what can I do? I sound like an old hippie, you know, do local, you know, grow the world, et cetera, <laughs> that, that, that whole concept. But, but if we go and we, we finish meetings like this and everybody leaves depressed, it's horrible, the worst is going to happen, there's nothing we can do about it, uh, then we've shot ourselves or broken our leg or shot ourselves in the foot, whatever it, whatever it is Never that we've done. We, at the end, you've got to have the people saying, it's serious, it's an issue, what can I do? And whether it's, an, like we said, a large agency, whether it's FEMA, we've all got to work on it, all, all these different levels, obviously, from national to international levels. But in the end, it's going to be an individual person saying, I hope there's something I could do to try to help this because... It's too depressing if it's not. And yeah. so don't leave this place saying, oh, it's horrible, the world's coming to an end. That may be a problem, but it's not the solution. <laughs> yeah. It reminds me when I was a kid, and uh, I don't know if anybody's seen those commercials like Smokey the Bear, and, and at the end, he said, only you can prevent forest fires. You know, so I used to walk around the house with two buckets of water, because I thought, <laughs> I'm going to prevent forest fires. The forest fire. So I think instead of giving out canvas bags, we give out buckets of water. Combat drought. There we go. All right. A two pronged piece for you. Uh, one of them kind of to, to start, uh, Michael laid this off. Um, and I was struck when you posed the question, I heard it differently than I've heard it in the past, which says, we've got a large big group of folks who um, live with inside the boundaries of the, this little power center uh, here with the building <laughs> on, uh, just down the block. Don't just talk about this on this street. Hmm. Talk about it on your street. And, and I really mean this. I've shown up in some communities where there are people who advocate for things down this street who have a very different answer when they have to explain it to their neighbors. Mm -hmm. So take the same level of energy that you may want to use when meeting uh, with folks like myself and advocating for a new and better answer and way for us to spend our money and make sure that you are doing that in your neighborhood. And when you come to uh, advocate with us, uh, first of all, you know, it's, it is valuable. We learned things in the process. Uh, but I got a little, little trick for you. <laughs> um, say thank you. There are incremental progress pieces being made. And there are folks in this town who work their tail off to make those pieces. And you will always be able to show us here's the next place to go. But make sure that when progress is made, you take note of it. You make sure that folks know this is good progress. It's insufficient. And Kevin will make that very clear again in a moment. Uh, but for the progress that we're making, uh, make sure we stop and reflect on that. So two-part answer. Is that OK? Yep. Uh, take advantage of opportunities. One, one of the things that's disappointing, I think, in the process of disaster assistance is this sort of rush to fund recovery efforts, in, in, including, of course, the immediate recovery kinds of things, but the opportunity to use that heavy federal dollars for these things to put conditions on them related to 
rebuilding or the use of green infrastructure or green infrastructure and gray infrastructure, it's an opportunity to take an enormous economic influence and, and uh, make, it, make it effective in that community. Uh, the second one, a specific one, uh, the National Traffic Safety Board uh, routinely goes in after a, an airplane crash, a train wreck, whatever it is, and, uh, and they study what went wrong and they bring in the various parties, not to assign fault, but to learn the lessons of that. Uh, it, it's, it seemed to me, and I uh, share this, Margaret Davidson of NOAA and, uh, and Bill Hook of uh, the National uh, American Meteorolo Meteorological Society, and I've been promoting this idea that a similar kind of initiative that focuses on lessons learned in these actual events would be a good thing to do. Thir third thing, I said two part, <laughs> third, three, three part. We, we've referenced several times, particularly the senators referenced several times about special interest groups and their, their nexus to this issue. I, I'm inclined to think that people feel probably uh, not influential on an individual basis, but most people associate with some group. Could be a union, it could be a sportsman's group, it could be a variety of these kinds of groups. I'm inclined to think if, if we who deal with the public policy issues can, can identify those groups and bring them into the discussion, uh, and have them understand the consequences for their members, they will be influential in the political process in ways that individuals probably aren't. Great. That's good. So I, I also have a, I, I can't ever just say one thing. So, <laughs> That's okay. a, a, a couple points then. One is, um, uh, do you, you know, we, we have to celebrate the small stuff. And whether that's a thank you to somebody at the right time or whether that's recognizing the small little victory we had today. Uh, I mean, you know, we, in, in all the work, that, anybody in this room obviously cares about oceans uh, and, and cares about a whole bunch of stuff. And so anything we do, we've got to make sure we celebrate the small stuff because the big stuff doesn't come, come along quite often enough. Uh, so that's my first point. My second point is, uh, I don't know how to be depressed. I'm just perpetually happy and pretty and enjoy life and so on. And I think that's important. Um, two points to answer your question now. One is, with regard to education, we've got to educate policymakers. Uh, and uh, folks in, in Congress, folks at the state level, folks at the city level, uh, and there's ways to get at that. Um, but obviously, I'm a little biased here, but there's such opportunity at the state level. It's incredible. Massachusetts, Maine, Maryland, Delaware, Oregon, California, Washington, and Alaska are all proactively pursuing ocean acidification remedies and actions that are out in front. And that's happening at the state level. Now, now a lot of that's happening because NOAA is supportive, so there's a great federal relationship there. But the state actions are incredible. And as far as educating policymakers, um, think of state legislators as the farm team. If you want to influence Congress, get to them before they're in Congress. In the 113th Congress sitting right now, 48.7% of the Senate and the House came directly from state legislators. If you cultivate, educate, and get passionate and excited about your issue as state legislator, it is very likely that they're going to go to Congress. So if you want to make a difference, start with the farm team. Um, my second point is, with regard to politicians, it doesn't matter if you're a small city mayor or a U.S. senator. I believe that politicians at every level need two things to do the right thing, and they need them both. Can't have one without the other. The first is political cover. I need 100 people to come into my hearing room and say, oh, my God, this is awesome. Please do this. Go for it. Um, but the second piece is political pressure. I need those same 100 people to come in and scream if it looks like I'm going to go sideways or if I do go sideways. So we've got to have political cover and political pressure, and that's where all of us also need to come in. Can, can I just play off that? Sure. Does it matter? You're the moderator. You get to do whatever you want. <laughs> and I have probably, I've got one, probably 30 seconds, but um, does it matter who those 100 people are? Of course, but uh, 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 well, yes, yes. The short answer is yes, it does. It does. Uh, but there's nothing like a constituent. Uh, I can have my attorney general come into me, and they will wait if I've got somebody from my district who wants to talk. Good. Well, I think we've heard some. I think we've heard some really, really good uh, advice. I, heard, I think we heard some really good insights from the panel members today. And you know, when I when I think about 
don't know how many people have seen the, the man walking the dog analogy. It's a cartoon that shows how climate and weather, it shows basically the dog is weather and there's a lot of these variations, but over time the man walking the dog is moving upward trend in terms of temperature. And I feel like this room is both of those. We are working our butts off, everybody, to kind of get the word out there and to push these issues and to do the science and to push the policy. And those are the ups and downs. And I agree, we should celebrate them because over time, our efforts will continue to rise and change the way we do business in this country. So I think we have to continue to move that forward. We've heard from the panel members today, they need that, they want that, because they're in positions that can make change. And so we need to keep fighting the good fight. Uh, yesterday I was looking at the Coastal Zone Management Act. It's, it was written in 72 with a couple amendments, but the word sea level rise was in there six times. We've been talking about this for 40 years. Wow. And we need to move it forward. Hey, so we need to keep moving this line up and move it forward. So I want to thank the panelists. If we can please give them a round of applause. And while we didn't get to all the questions, Jason, uh, I think we did cover a number of them in the answers they provide at the end. And some of them might be sticking around, hopefully, uh, for conversations with those in the audience. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. A special thank you to the Admiral when we heard about your accident last week. We weren't sure you'd make it, and we're delighted that you put in the extra effort to, to be here. Uh, and as an ultimate Frisbee player, invite me next time you're on the, on the pitch. Uh, we will take a half-hour break. We're going to uh, reconvene at 3 o'clock for our last panel of the day, which will look at how the U.S. shapes and is shaped by international issues. Uh, I do want to say again uh, and call your attention to what's going on on Capitol Hill Ocean Talk. We've talked a lot this morning about how to galvanize public attention on ocean issues, and we talked about the dire consequences and the doom and gloom that the ocean is facing. Well, another way to engage the public on the ocean is by what there is to celebrate and what draws us as individuals and as a society towards the ocean. And so being featured on Capitol Hill Ocean Talk is Steve White, the president of Mystic Seaport. And this summer they are celebrating the restoration of what is now the uh, oldest commercial ship of the United States back restored to seaworthiness and on the seas. And in fact, this summer going to Stillwagon Bank National Marine Sanctuary, having uh, done 37 voyages as a whale hunter, she now returns to the seas as a whale shepherd and a whale observer. And so Steve will be talking about this effort and everything that the Seaport has been doing on Capitol Hill Ocean Talk, and I invite you guys to watch, and I'll see you in half an hour. Thank you. <laughs>